Snow White and Rose, read by Brothers Grimm Short Stories for Kids. Today we have a book named Snow White and Rose, read by Brothers Grimm Short Stories for Kids. I think they're so pretty. I hope you guys really enjoy it. I love it. Please give this video a like if you enjoy it, and don't forget to subscribe for more stories. Thank you, reading. So, here we go. A poor widow once lived in a little cottage. In front of the cottage was a garden in which were growing two rose trees. One of these bore white roses and the other red. She had two children who resembled the rose trees. One was called Snow White and the other rose, red. And they were as religious and loving, busy and untiring as any two children ever were. Snow White was more gentle and quieter than her sister, who liked better skipping about the fields, seeking flowers, and catching summer birds. While Snow White stayed at home with her mother, either helping her in her work or, when that was done, reading aloud. The two children had the greatest affection, the one for the other. They were always seen hand in hand. And should Snow White say to her sister, We will never separate, the other would reply. Not while we live, the mother adding, that which one has, let her always share with the other. They constantly ran together in the woods, collecting ripe berries. But not a single animal would have injured them. Quite the reverse, they all felt the greatest admiration for the young creatures. The hare came to eat parsley from their hands, the deer grazed by their side, the stag bounded past them with no notice. The birds, likewise, did not stir from the branches, but sang in entire safety. Nothing bad happened to them. If they were stuck for the night in the wood, they lay down on the moss to rest and sleep till the morning. And their mother was satisfied as to their safety and did not worry about them. Once, when they had spent the night in the wood and the bright sunrise awoke them, they saw a beautiful child in a snow-white robe, shining like diamonds, sitting close to the spot where they had slept. She arose when they opened their eyes and looked kindly at them, but said no word and passed from their sight into the wood. When the children looked around, they saw they had been sleeping on the edge of a cliff and would surely have fallen over if they had gone forward two steps further in the darkness. Their mother said the beautiful child must have been the angel who keeps watch over good children. Snow White and Rose, Red kept their mother's cottage so clean that it gave pleasure only to look in. In summertime, Rose, Red attended to the house, and every morning before her mother awoke, placed by her bed a bouquet, which had in it a rose from each of the rose trees. In wintertime, Snow White set light to the fire and put on the kettle, after polishing it until it was like gold for brightness. In the evening, when snow was falling, her mother would bid her bolt the door, and then, sitting by the hearth, the good widow would read aloud to them from a big book while the little girls were spinning. Close by them lay a lamb, and a white pigeon, with its head tucked under its wing, was on a perch behind. One evening, as they were all sitting cozily together like this, there was a knock at the door, as if someone wished to come in. Make haste, Rose, Red, said her mother. Open the door. It is surely some traveler seeking shelter. Rose, Red, accordingly pulled back the bolt, expecting to see some poor man. But it was nothing of the kind. It was a bear that thrust his big black head in at the open door. Rose, Red, cried out and sprang back. The lamb bleated, the dove fluttered her wings, and Snow White hid herself behind her mother's bed. The bear began speaking and said, Do not be afraid. I will not do you any harm. 
I am half frozen and would like to warm myself a little at your fire. Poor bear, the mother replied. Come in and lie by the fire. Only be careful that your hair is not burnt. Then she called Snow, White, and Rose, Red telling them that the bear was kind and would not harm them. They came as she bade them, and presently the lamb and the dove drew near also without fear. Children, begged the bear, knock some of the snow off my coat. So they brought the broom and brushed the bear's coat quite clean. After that, he stretched himself out in front of the fire and pleased himself by growling a little, only to show that he was happy and comfortable. Before long, they were all quite good friends, and the children began to play with their superse visitor, pulling his thick fur or placing their feet on his back or rolling him over and over. Then they took a slender hazel twig, using it upon his thick coat, and they laughed when he growled. The bear permitted them to amuse themselves in this way, only occasionally calling out, when it went a little too far, Children, spare me an inch of life. When it was night, and all were making ready to go to bed, the widow told the bear, You may stay here and lie by the hearth if you like, so that you will be sheltered from the cold and from the bad weather. The offer was accepted, but when morning came, as the day broke in the east, the two children let him out and over the snow he went back into the wood. After this, every evening at the same time the bear came, lay by the fire, and allowed the children to play with him. So they became quite fond of their curious playmate, and the door was not ever bolted in the evening until he had appeared. When springtime came and all around began to look green and bright, one morning the bear said to Snow, White, now I must leave you and all the summer long I shall not be able to come back. Where, then, are you going, dear bear? asked Snow White. I have to go to the woods to protect my treasure from the bad dwarves. In winter time, when the earth is frozen hard, they must remain underground and cannot make their way through. But now that the sunshine has thawed the earth, they can come to the surface, and whatever gets into their hands, or is brought to their caves, seldom if ever, again, sees daylight. Snow White was very sad when she said goodbye to the good-natured beast and unfastened the door that he might go. But in going out, he was caught by a hook in the lintel and a scrap of his fur being torn. Snow White thought there was something shining like gold through the rip, but he went out so quickly that she could not feel certain what it was, and soon he was hidden among the trees. One day, the mother sent her children into the wood to pick up stick. They found a big tree lying on the ground. It had been felled, and towards the roots they noticed something skipping and springing, which they could not make out, as it was sometimes hidden in the grasses. As they came nearer, they could see it was a dwarf, with a shriveled-up face and a long snow-white beard. The beard was fixed in a gash in the tree trunk, and the tiny fellow was hopping to and fro, like a dog at the end of a string, but he could not manage to free himself. He stared at the children with his red, fiery eyes and called out, Why are you standing there? Can't you come and try to help me? What were you doing, little fellow? inquired Rose. Red. Stupid, inquisitive goose, replied the dwarf. I meant to split the trunk so that I could chop it up for kitchen sticks. Big logs would burn up the small quantity of food we cook, for people like us do not consume great heaps of food, as you heavy, greedy folk do. But my tool caught my handsome white beard. And here I must stop, for I cannot set myself free. You stupid, pale-faced creatures, you laugh, do you? In spite of the dwarf's bad temper, the girls took all possible pains to release the little man, but without avail, the beard could not be moved. It was wedged too tightly. I will run and get someone else, said Rose, red. Idiot, cried the dwarf. Who would go and get more people? Already there are two too many. 
can't you think of something better? Don't be so impatient, said Snow White. I will try to think. She clapped her hands as if she had discovered a remedy, took out her scissors, and in a moment set the dwarf free by cutting off the end of his beard. Immediately the dwarf felt that he was free. He seized a sack full of gold that was hidden amongst the tree's roots, and lifting it up, grumbled out, clumsy creatures, to cut off a bit of my beautiful beard, of which I am so proud, I leave the cuckoos to pay you for what you did. Saying this, he swung the sack across his shoulder and went off, without even casting a glance at the children. Not long afterwards, the two sisters went to angle in the river, meaning to catch fish for dinner. As they were drawing near the water, they perceived something, looking like a large grasshopper, springing towards the stream, as if it were going in. They hurried up to see what it might be, and found that it was the dwarf, where are you going? said Rose, red. Surely you will not jump into the water? I'm not such a simpleton as that, yelled the little man. Don't you see that a wretch of a fish is pulling me in? The dwarf had been sitting angling from the side of the stream when, by bad luck, he had tangled his beard in his line and just afterwards a big fish, taking the bait, the nasty little fellow had not enough strength to pull it out. So the fish had the advantage and was dragging the dwarf after it. Certainly he caught at every stalk and branch near him, but that did not help him much. He was forced to follow all the twistings of the fish and was in danger of being drawn into the river. The girls arrived just in time. They caught hold of him firmly and tried to untwist his beard from the line, but in vain. They were too tightly tangled. There was nothing left but again to make use of the scissors. So they were taken out and the tangled portion was cut off. When the dwarf noticed what they were about, he exclaimed in a great rage, Is this how you damage my beard? Not content with making it shorter before, you are now making it still smaller and completely spoiling it? I shall not ever dare show my face to my friend. I wish you had missed your way before you took this road. Then he fetched a sack of pearls that lay among the rushes, and not saying another word, hobbled off and disappeared behind a large stone. Soon after this, it happened that the poor widow sent her children to the town to purchase cotton, needles, ribbon, and tape. The way to the town ran over a common, on which in every direction large masses of rocks were scattered about. The children's attention was soon attracted to a big bird that hovered in the air. They remarked that, after circling slowly for a time, and gradually getting nearer to the ground, it all of a sudden pounced down amongst a mass of rock. Instantly, a heart-rending cry reached their ears, and running quickly to the place they saw, with horror, that the eagle had seized their former acquaintance, the dwarf, and was just about to carry him off. The kind children did not hesitate for an instant. They took a firm hold of the little man and fought so hard with the eagle for the dwarf that, after much rough treatment on both sides, the dwarf was left in the hands of his brave little friends, and the eagle took to flight. As soon as the little man had in some measure recovered from his alarm, his small, squeaky, cracked voice was heard saying, Couldn't you have held me more gently? See my little coat? You have torn and damaged it in a fine manner, you clumsy, interfering things. Then he picked up a sack of jewels and slipped out of sight behind a piece of rock. The maidens by this time were quite used to his ungrateful, ungracious ways. So they took no notice of it, but went on their way, made their purchases, and then were ready to return to their happy home. On their way back, suddenly, once more they ran across their dwarf friend. Upon a clear space he had turned out his sack of jewels, so that he could count and admire them, for he had not imagined that anybody would at so late an hour be coming across the common. The setting sun was shining upon the brilliant stones, 
and their changing hues and sparkling rays caused the children to pause to admire them also. What are you gazing at? cried the dwarf, at the same time becoming red with rage. And what are you standing there for, making ugly faces? It is probable that he might have proceeded in the same way, but suddenly a great growl was heard nearby them, and a big black bear joined the party. Up jumped the dwarf in extremist terror, but could not get to his hiding place. The bear was too close to him. So he cried out in very evident anguish. Dear Mr. Bear, forgive me, I pray. I will give to you all my treasure. Just see those precious stones lying there. Grant me my life. What would you do with such a tiny little fellow? You would not notice me between your teeth. See, though, those two children, they would be delicious and are as plump as partridges. I beg of you to take them, good Mr. Bear, and let me go. But the bear would not be moved by his speeches. He gave the ill-disposed creature a blow with his paw, and he limped away as fast as he could into the forest. Meanwhile, the maidens were running away, making off for home as well as they could. But all of a sudden they were stopped by a well-known voice that called out, Snow, white, rose, red, stay, do not fear. I will accompany you. The bear quickly came towards them, but as he reached their side, suddenly the bear's skin slipped to the ground, and there before them was standing a handsome man completely clothed in gold, who said, I am a king's son who was enchanted by the wicked dwarf lying over there. He stole my treasure and compelled me to roam the woods turned into into a big bear until his punishment should set me free. Therefore he has only received a well-deserved punishment. Sometime afterwards, Snow White married the prince and Rose read his brother. They shared between them the enormous treasure which the dwarf had collected in his cave. The old mother spent many happy years with her children. The End Good job, friends. Thank you so much for reading with me. Bye, I'll see you next time.